torture, death, disease. All right, guys, here we are in Dublin, Ireland. We're going to be visiting a museum that'll give us a glimpse into life in medieval times. Let's check it out. Our journey begins here, on the streets of medieval Dublin, which, as you can see, were bustling with activity. These young rascals are playing a game called Drafts, a medieval version of Checkers, the game we know and love today. Here we see a shoemaker. On the left, we see a pair of children's shoes, which were often made from the scraps of worn out adult shoes. In the middle, a pair of poulains. These pointed shoes were quite fashionable at the time and were worn by rich, fashion conscious men. And on the right, a pair of patens, which are a type of protective overshoe designed to keep your leather footwear from getting dirty. Now let's take a look inside a medieval kitchen. Meat, grains, veggies, and berries were a staple of the medieval diet. But what you ate and how it was served depended greatly on your social status. Can you guess who ate their meals off a pewter plate? The merchant and his family, as pewter was an expensive metal. How about a wooden plate? The merchant's apprentice, which gave rise to the expression, a good square meal. And who used a slice of bread as a plate? The servants, and afterwards they gave them to the poor. After a hearty meal and a quick nap by the fire, it's off to the Dublin Fair. Ah. The right to host a fair was a valuable privilege and was granted to the city of Dublin by King John in the year 1215. The fair lasted 15 days during the month of July, and any persons or goods that entered or left the grounds were charged a fee, or custom. For example, of every full load of merchandise belonging to one man, two pence. Of every ox or cow, two pence. There was much to be discovered at the Dublin Fair. Food, goods, medicine, spices, and even entertainment. The great fairs attract international traders who often need credit or foreign currency. Non-denominational tokens would be used to calculate exchange rates. Let's begin our tour of the Dublin Fair here at the medicine booth. Can you guess the medieval cures for these common ailments? A wound. Well, that would be treated by burning the wound with a red hot iron to disinfect it. And a case of the pox? That would be treated with leeches. What about leprosy? Sorry, there's no cure for that. How about an earache? That would be cured by inserting a clove of garlic into the ear. Ooh, an excruciating toothache? Well, extract that tooth. And how about the common headache? That would be cured by drinking a brew of barley. Wouldn't that just be beer? Next is the spicer's stall. Exotic spices were imported from foreign lands, especially by Italian and Flemish merchants. They were valued for their use in preserving food and for the strong and aromatic flavors that they gave to elegant dishes. And now we find ourselves at the cloth and clothing stall. One of the most important commodities traded at fairs is cloth. In fact, many fairs began with a market selling only cloth. Fine wool is imported from England, while silks are brought in from the east by merchants from Italy. And now we've reached my favorite, the pie stall. 
These tasty snacks, sold at the fair, are prepared by local bakers whose ovens are located outside the city walls on nearby Cook Street to prevent fires from spreading into the city. The pies would be filled with fruits, spices, and minced meat, either rabbit, pork, venison, or maybe even swan. And now let's take a look at the weapons and armor booth. War was never far from the minds of Dublin's inhabitants, as the city was under constant threat of attack. Small weapons could be purchased on the street year-round, however the fair was the place to be if you wanted to find the latest developments in arms and armor. From here we head to Port, where we can learn about the all-important sea trade. The journey east from Dublin to Wales took roughly three days, whereas the return trip could take as many as 12 due to strong westerly winds. If you were to mail a letter from Dublin to London in the 16th century, it would take about nine days. Not too bad for the time. Despite the hazards, including piracy, transporting bulk dry goods by sea and navigable waterways was much easier and more cost effective than by way of pack animal or carts across dry land. Now let's delve into the darker side of Dublin as we learn about crime and punishment. A chartered town or city of the kind Dublin became in 1192 had control over most legal matters involving laymen and women. However, serious crimes, including arson and rape, were handled in the king's court, and the list of punishments? Well, let's just say they were very creative. Lesser crimes, the kind dealt with through city court, often included public humiliation. Shown here is a scold's bridle, a device forced on women who were too outspoken, nagged, or gossiped too much. It wasn't enough just to restrict this woman's limbs. She would be displayed in town, where vengeful people could throw eggs and rotten fruit at. And if the law didn't get you, it was very likely death and disease would. If you remember from the medicine booth at the fair, medieval cures weren't always all that sophisticated. 15% of women probably died during childbirth. A man's average life expectancy at birth was only 30 years, even before the Black Death arrived and almost one-third of all children died before the age of 10. In 1348, one of the deadliest diseases of all time reaches Dublin. It was a plague, and people who got it developed big black boils on their body. Because of this, it later became known as the Black Death. It was a terrible disease without a cure. The Black Plague was caused by a bacteria which was often found in the blood of rats. Like most medieval cities, Dublin was infested with thousands of rats, and those rats were infested with fleas. The fleas would bite the rats, ingesting their tainted blood, and then later bite humans, spreading the disease. If you caught the plague, big black boils would form on your body. You would get headaches and a fever, and you'd be dead in about three days. Later, more deadly forms of the plague began to appear, which could kill you in a matter of hours. For those who caught this deadly disease, doctors would recommend alcohol, and priests prayed for miracles. City officials began marking households which had the plague with a large X on the door. Every night, city workers would come with carts to haul away the dead bodies from these houses. Now let's head up to the top of the tower and see what kind of views of Dublin we can get. Alright, that was awesome. What do you guys think? Life in medieval times? Yes or no? Let me know in the comments below. 
Anyway, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel to get future notifications for all my latest videos. Once again, thanks for watching.